uh, for supporting today. Thanks for everyone rocking up. Fantastic to see the likes of BHP and Rio contributing to the presentation today. They've been a very closed black box for many, many years if you haven't been involved with them. So um, it's great to see some of that information disseminating out to uh, all of us uh, in the broader survey community. <coughs> Uh, my name is Brett Grocock. I'm from a company called Mind Survey Plus. Uh, we are contract mine surveyors and providers of technical mine survey solutions. Um, we've operated in six countries at the moment, three states in Western Australia, and uh, we've got a team of 13 other people running around. So um, yeah, it's a good, good company. I think everyone has a, has a pretty good time. Um, yeah, General Murphy's over in Tanzania right now. Um, been in the Philippines a couple of times, uh, up to Freeport, to DRC, and um, plenty of spots in WA and a few different places as well. Wrong button again. Um, our background, what I'm going to be talking on today is a sharp project up at uh, Tanamai in, uh, in the Northern Territory. Um, my background with sharp works started at Olympic Dam in, um, in South Australia there on the Wenham shaft. Uh, this is the Wenham shaft after all the shaft furniture was stripped out um, and the head frame was taken off. Uh, you can see the precinct here, which is the concrete formwork that they're putting through the soft sand. They put that in so obviously all the sand doesn't fall into the shaft. And what they wanted was there's a uh, ring beam about 50 metres down and they said we need a laser scan of that ring beam. Um, and, but we weren't allowed in the shaft at all. So my solution was uh, pull noodles, a laser scanner mounted upside down underneath and um, suspend that thing from a crane and lower it down, slew the crane right over so it's parked in the corner, take a scan and slew the crane over again and, and, um, and go. When, when he called me up, I said, I'm not sure that we can, uh, we can actually do it, but we'll give it a crack. And he said, yeah, that's the best offer we've had. So yeah, we did it. Gave them the data they required and it was a good result. Previous to that, um, before they condemned the shaft, we'd, uh, when I was with land surveys, we'd actually done a traverse down, laser scan the whole thing, heat mapped all the cracks that you can see there um, to show conformance of the shaft uh, versus design. So land surveys are still absolutely capable of doing all that sort of stuff and if you need it, go see them because I don't have that capability anymore. Um, also did some work in the Philippines um, this project, there was a few uh, shafts that we plumbed and also traversed down. This is a 60 degree incline shaft. Uh, you see Safety's big factory, you've got the rope tying off the uh, instrument there, which was, which was good. Um, and there's a great big steel plate here, and you can see this exposed dirt there. That's where the mountain had slipped down previously. So I thought we'd put a good big steel plate in there and protect the shaft, which was good. Um, 83 three metre ladders to climb down the bottom of that one um, and uh, yeah that was quite an experience um, and that project was with, uh, well, was with spectrum survey mapping back in the day so yeah that was, uh, that was good fun as well so Tanamai Shaft we haven't had much success with videos let's see how we go with this one it's working um, Yep, it's, that's the funny looking pit and um, the, the shafts uh, <laughs> the shaft is there, they're doing a huge expansion project all around, all around there, they're diverting, that's a 40 kilometre haul road that goes out to the mill and the camp, so it's a 13 and a half hour day front door to front door. Um, this whole mining complex has been here for 20 odd years. You often wonder how much fuel they spent, how much time they're spending people. Fatigue, 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 that's what we're all about out there. And, um, but yeah, they haven't built a camp out there, which I find amusing on a daily basis. Um, so this is the head frame that's sitting on top of the shaft. Uh, obviously, or this is the winder room out the back here. Uh, it's a very small head frame, but um, the beauty of being a surveyor on a, on a project like this is you get involved in all sorts of different things. So uh, this is bogging out the um, bogging out the sump, but just to show you the uh, the cycle as uh, as the kibbles come up from underground, um, 
you probably get uh, 60 odd buckets per, per shot each time they advance the bench, uh, two and a half to three metre benches uh, each time. So that was uh, when we first started, you can see the wall stations there. We're using the white spigots with the, uh, with the grub screw inside that expands out and then the stainless steel adapters onto the uh, metal house uh, standard like a survey prisms. Obviously we had control, a control network on the surface. This was the first lot of control that we put in. And then each three meter advance they're doing a slip form uh, concrete barrel. So we lower the ring, lower the barrel or, and then we position the ring, pick up the excavation, calculate over breaks and all that sort of stuff. Then they lower the barrel, pour the concrete, they'll typically fire. And then once they fire, uh, we'll set up on the heave, come and install a new control point. So there's control points every three metres. Uh, and once that control point's in, we'll then do an as-built of the concrete as well. And from those as-builts of the concrete and the positioning of the uh, kerb, we calculate a centre point of the shaft. We compare that to design. Uh, we compare the radius and all that as well, just making sure that that we're not uh, shifting out too much. You can see the um, curb ring there. So that gets lowered down, block and chain, uh, typically from the stage. We position that. You've got all these, uh, so that's uh, jack screw down there. So you've got six of those all around the bottom of the, uh, the curb ring. And we basically get a big uh, rattle gun, wind those in and out to position that curb ring. Of course, it's not uh, perfectly round, so we've got to adjust on the fly and just try and get a best fit. Uh, once that's all positioned, they put um, dagger boards, I think they call them, or something, in, into here, and that pushes up against the rock. They put uh, some uh, plywood cut out circular arcs uh, between the ring beam and the rock, put that on, put some mesh down, and then, um, then they'll bring this barrel down. So if you ignore that, they'll bring this barrel down onto here and bolt all that in and then pour concrete in behind it. Uh, typically about 20, around 20 cubes of concrete uh, per pour. What you're looking at there uh, is looking back up at the stage. Uh, depending where you work, that's either called a stage or a galloway. It's a two deck suspended um, structure that's suspended from the head frame and through the middle of that stage passes the man cage which you can see up there or a kibble um, and down on the bench they've got a small one tonne excavator or something that fills up that kibble as they go to blast they attach the excavator to the bottom of the stage lift it right up blast lower everything back down and start again uh, you can see here both, you can see a wall station here and typically they'll be spiralling around as you can see here. Okay. Um, we do, when we put in new control, we do a four point resection uh, shooting to a new uh, station, doing sets of angles, typically four to five sets. Um, and yeah, we're getting fantastic results as you'll see shortly. Just to give you a bit of an idea of what's down the hole, this is the man cage that we come down in. Uh, maximum five persons, that's, that's pretty friendly when it's, when it's that many people. Everything gets coated in dust and everything, so this is the excavator here. This is the kibble. Um, the ring beam hasn't been lowered down yet. This is looking straight down the shaft. You can see the barrel is sitting down there. Uh, excavator, kibble, bit of water, that sort of stuff. Um, so we are going down 240 metres, um, we are, there is a drill bit that's snapped off in a shear, uh, we're going to go pick up that drill bit and then we're going to backfill the whole thing with concrete and they're going to raise ball back down through it again. Seems excessive, I don't know why they went five and a half metres but I well, probably would have gone a bit smaller and just got down there, got that bit and got back up. So these are the wall plugs we're using. Um, I've really enjoyed them, I think they're really good, uh, I'd like to see them in more underground environments as opposed to the long spigots, I think the positioning of them is more repeatable um, and 
and more it's more obvious if something's gone wrong or if you've got going from there you can clean it out quite easily we were going through a stage where we're getting a um, I think it's an M8 bolt with just a rubber grommet on it and just screwing that bolt in just to keep that um, keep this area nice and clean um, but otherwise it's a bit of water, a bit of air and, and you're good to go uh, Kim Wilkinson um, he is now at Carapatina fantastic surveyor, lovely bloke and um, yeah worked in across a couple, Chad and I probably worked in across a couple of different organisations now so we do run plumb lines, plumb lines never lie um, unless this is shifted, this is bent or something like that so this is, this is what's called a steady bracket so if you're hanging a plumb line 240 metres, 700 metres, whatever depth your shaft is if you haven't got these in your lines it's going to swing round a lot okay so if we position these uh, then run the plumb line through then position this accurately and then away we go we're only using the plumb lines for checks at the moment because we've got the wall station control as we traverse down and for us uh, as you'll see in the results that the results from that have been really good but what we're doing here is obviously we're running the plumb line all the way down putting a 360 degree prism on it doing a resection off our wall station control and then doing auto survey to that 360 degree prism for 20 minutes if we can uh, quite often we don't get that long so we do whatever we can do as I said we're just running for a check so it's not too bad so this is a little animation of how the network is getting built I think uh, sorry go back one so this is it's a bit hard to see but this is the shaft here we set up in the middle, four point resection and shoot our new wall station in. Okay, we put that in at least squares, we don't do any adjustment or anything with it. Uh, we save it as the day's job, but then we save it as um, the day's job station name master and then introduce the previous master file into it. We run a full adjustment on that, and as you can see, we're getting these are our error ellipses, it's, it's pretty well gobbledygook. It's uh, the only thing that sort of makes sense is when you look at the results. Uh, there's a little animation of how the network comes together from a plan view. You can see the redundancy. You'll see up here, we'll put a station in up here somewhere. And you'll see the redundancy getting built into those stations. So each time you see a new line added, that's a new setup. Typically we get five setups, we shoot the same prism from five different locations okay so we've got plenty of redundancy and then this is uh, a sexual view um, looking at how it, it's developing as we go further down so we're, we're getting multiple shots to the same location um, we are running we are calibrating our jigger every week we're getting plenty of sets We've got plenty of data, plenty of redundancy. The only thing that does concern me is because it's a round sharp, is rotation. Okay, we're doing very steep shots across a very short horizontal distance. So, what what effect is rotation having? Uh, I don't know. And does it matter on this job? No, it doesn't. Okay. Once I start, uh, once I put the raised bore through, pull that up start putting shaft furniture in then yes uh, rotation will certainly be an issue and we'll, we'd be looking at utilising plumb lines I dare say for the majority of that work uh, sorry so I've just updated this today from the uh, the, the two, the two um, shots here so we've got 135 stations in there so we've got about 60 68 wall stations and all the rest of TPs set up in the middle of the shaft we're mm -hmm. running 10,752 observa individual 
uh, observation points um, in that data set. Okay. Um, we're passing our F test very comfortably. Uh, filing our chief square test on the lower bound, which is fine, just means we're not putting in tight enough tolerances into our standard deviations. But we can't get much tighter. I think our distances are 0.8 of a mil with zero millimeters ppm. Um, our vertical angles are a couple of seconds, and, and I think our biggest is our um, directions, which might be two seconds or something like that. So it's all really, really tight. We're down to, this is our, for those back, um, S049, we're up to S068 or something at the moment. And still our standard, um, our error lips is a sub millimetre by millimetre. Um, so we're pretty confident what we're doing is uh, pretty well spot on. So using those plumb lines, We've done, we've done a plumb line check at 80 metres, 140 metres and 160 metres. We are getting good agreements uh, to the surface uh, plumb line coordinates. So if you see, this is our surface coordinates for the plumb lines, these are our sharp coordinates for the plumb lines, and these are the delta northings, delta eastings. Okay? So again, pretty tight. Um, there's a lot of data here, but the distance between from plumb line one to design centre, surface distance, shaft distance, and then deltas over on the right. And then here we've got deltas in azimuth, deltas in distance uh, between individual plumb lines. Uh, a delta azimuth of two minutes over four, 4.3 metres, I'm, I'm not particularly worried about in this instance. And then 120 below, a um, bit of creep on the delta east and delta north and northings up the top, um, but again I think the biggest we've got there is uh, 6 million northing and then at 160 metres below that's that 6 million northing uh, has saved pretty constant about 5 mil. Everything else is again still looking pretty constant and pretty tight and uh, and we're feeling pretty good that what we're trying to achieve in, for this specific project, we're, we're staying within those tolerances. I found, I found this interesting. Uh, on the side here is millimetres. That's one millimetre there, 1.2, 1.4. Um, and, and this is our depth, so from uh, 1405 to 1228 depth up there. Um, I actually projected this out. This is a two-stage shaft, so they're going to uh, raise ball the first 705 metres, leave a 20 metre pillar, raise ball the next 700 metres or so. And I projected it out uh, to the bottom of the 700 metre shaft, we're looking at around 50 mil. Okay. If we were going to run uh, deeper than that, I'd probably uh, start using more of the influence from the plumb lines. Or even if we were going to go to that depth, I would start using more influence from plumb lines. An interesting um, process I did just recently is I used the surface uh, plumb line position to calculate uh, the wall station position at 160 metres. And that, that was all done through least squares, uh, some vertical connections and that sort of stuff, some funky sort of things that I've got them, uh, the guys at Move 3 over in Germany or wherever they're from, Netherlands, to, uh, to help me with in terms of the actual uh, process. But the difference, the biggest difference between my traversed control station down the bottom and the control derived from the plumb lines measured down the bottom and then recalculated back to the wall station is about two mil. So that was, uh, yeah, I gave myself a little pat on the back for that one. I was pretty happy with that. So that was good. Um, so yeah, look, for what we're doing, uh, something we're going to fill with concrete, what we're doing is absolute overkill. It's, it's completely over the top. But the client wants to know what their overbreak is. They're, they're worried about who's paying for the uh, additional concrete when it's 27 metres as opposed to design of 18 or whatever, you know. Um, so 
what what they're spending on survey is completely out of kilter with what they should be doing. But anyway, <coughs> we're loving it. It's great. Um, so could you have achieved what they're trying to achieve from other options? Yeah, possibly. Uh, plumb lines. Oh, I'd be interested to see how long you've actually got to wait for those plumb lines to settle to get an accurate measurement. Someone comes, knocks it with their butt or whatever, and you've got to wait another 20 minutes. Uh, I think we we can to set that curve in. We can get in and out in about an hour 15 from by the time we step foot in the cage at the top to by the time we set out. Um, the guys grizzle and moan. They've got to use the stage, go up and down, which is very slow. To so we can set our prisms, then go pick them up again. But um, yeah, we usually bring them a packet of Tim Tams or something, and they're pretty happy. Um, so yeah, could you use laser plummets? It's I've, I've often thought about that. Um, I've seen lasers in declines over like big cannon lasers uh, where they've had the bogger bogging down the bottom and we've turned the laser on with all the gunk in the air and all that sort of stuff, marked the laser on the wall and then come back two hours later with nothing happening and then the laser's shifted 400 mil. So yeah, that's atmospheric can have a big influence on lasers. What influence that would have in a shaft, I'm not too sure. Optical plummets, you're not going to get that over the 250 metres we're working. Plumb lines, I think we'll discuss the inherent risks you've got there. So yeah, look, it's an interesting project. Um, the survey requirements are slight, but uh, when you're required, you've got to be there. So we do night shift, um, we're going for night shift and all that sort of stuff, but it's pretty cool if it comes to 10 o'clock in the morning, there's a chance you might have to come in on night shift, you go home and wait for the call at 3 a.m. and just rock on in and work work till 9, 10 a.m. and go home and sleep the rest of the day. So yeah, it's uh, it's a good project. We've learned plenty of other skills. We've been, all the guys uh, have been getting down there and helping with collaring when, they, when you've got four air leg machines running all around, you've got two sets of hearing in and shit's going everywhere and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy, but, but good fun. So, taking on a project like this, uh, yeah, as, as I've often said, say yes to opportunity and um, yeah, quite often have a good time. So, any questions? Sweet, thank you.